Hello, my name is Nelum. I am a GP from Australia. Um, so uh, I have a, a particularly particular interest in the South Asian community. Um, and, um, you know, this group of people are, are very high risk and um, at, they are iller at lower BMIs. And, um, you know, they tend to fall into the toffee category, um, thin on the outside and fat on the inside. So my question really is to Mariella and Cynthia, have you had much experience treating this group of people, particularly with their cultural conditioning? Uh, yes, actually. I've had a lot of experience treating Tofi, and uh, it's, uh, it responds beautifully to keto, low-carb, uh, because essentially, you know, what Tofi, I always think of it as you just don't have enough fat cells subcutaneous to, to, to become a, an insulin-sensitive obese person. So you immediately start doing ectopic fat, and that is very problematic. But, you know, it works. It works great. Especially fatty liver. I see that really melting away very, very fast. Um, I 100% agree. I would also indicate these are the types of patients that do particularly well with intermittent fasting in particular. Um, they do beautifully well along with the macronutrient changes. Thank you. Yep, I, I agree. <laughs> never, uh, never argue with two women. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add, because we, we talked about the metabolic inside being problematic, and yeah, low-carb restriction definitely seems to improve that in many ways. But the thin part, I think you've got to add resistance training and enough protein. I think that's a, that's a big, important part, because, I mean, we have just as much as have an, ep an obesity epidemic, we have, a, I think, a frailty epidemic. I think that's a real problem, so you have to, you have to address both sides of the coin. Thank you. My question uh, is primarily for Cynthia, but obviously for all of you guys. Um, with the android versus gynoid phenotype, what do you think is primarily causing, I mean, beyond genetics, what would primarily cause one person to gather more fat in the viscera and liver versus store it subcutaneously? Are we thinking it's more fructose consumption versus, you know, maybe starches, the reason somebody else would, would store subcutaneously? Or are we thinking more seed oils? Just kind of wanted you guys' thoughts on that. Okay, so the question was, you know, apple versus pear, men versus women. I mean, obviously, there's a sex difference, right? I mean, so women are going to store. Why do women store body fat? I will say, I got a DEXA scan. I'm technically gynoid. Well, I don't know about that. Per, per, the, per the DEXA scan. <laughs> Anyway, but I mean, you know, it's interesting why we store body, body fat where we do. I mean, biomechanically, it makes sense. Why, you know, if I'm going to carry a big weight around, I'm not going to put it on the end of my finger. I'm going to carry it in, close to my center of mass. Males have a higher center of mass because of our bigger shoulder sizes than women. Women tend to have bigger, stronger legs and smaller shoulders, so their fat storage is going to be a little bit lower. So we typically see women have fat around the hips. Guys have it around the bellies. Obviously, there's hormonal impacts on there. There's some genetic impacts on there. I don't know if any particular dietary strategy is going to favor where you store your fat. I think you store your fat where you store your fat is. And I, I, to my knowledge, I don't know if you can say if I eat more fructose, it's going to go to my hips versus if I eat more butter, it's going to go to my belly. I mean, there has been some analysis, actually, it's interesting that they look at, you know, the different components of fat, like saturated fat versus unsaturated fat and where it stores in the body. You know, maybe diet has an impact on that, but I, I, it's not something I've looked in too significantly. I mean, I, I, you know, either, you're, either you got too much fat or you don't. But belly fat, particularly visceral fat, we know is much worse. And that's why men have higher rates of heart disease. And women can have a little more body fat and, and, and do fine. So maybe there's an advantage. But as a male, I don't want to be particularly estrogenized. I think that's probably problematic for other reasons. But anyway, I don't Peter, if you have any insight. Yeah, look, I think it's, it's, it's primarily hormonal. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things is I, I had a, a close friend, actually, who who was, uh, well, close to morbidly obese, but he had a combination, really, of, of both peripheral and, and, and visceral fat, and uh, got him on a, on a much better diet. And he lost all his peripheral fat, but didn't lose any of his, uh, his visceral fat. You know? And I, I can't really explain why, preferentially, you lose one uh, than the other. Obviously, we know, you know visceral fat is, is so important, um, because uh, basically it... it it contributes to inflammation. I mean, uh, something I didn't realize for many years is that the adipocytes in visceral fat secrete inflammatory cytokines. So, you know, you've got the, uh, 
the poor diet that makes you fat in the first place, which is inflammatory, and then on top of that, you've got the, uh, the fat cells in increasing the, uh, the amount of inflammation. So you've got a double whammy in, uh, in visceral fat. But uh, I, I, yeah, I can't really give you a good explanation as to, uh, to why one person develops it in one place and the other, other than the, the hormonal uh, male-female hormonal differences. I would just add that in my clinical experience, I would say inflammatory seed oils and high fructose corn syrup. And we have Dr. Rick Johnson. Is Dr. Rick in the, he might not. Yes, Dr. Rick Johnson is the expert in fructose. So, you know, if you understand the physiology of how fructose is absorbed in the body and how it goes directly to the liver, that can help contribute to the visceral fat. Dr. Rick, you, is that a thumbs up? Yep, okay. <laughs> Anything you want to add? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's. Following Dr. Westman's rule, my name's Cassie Jinks. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. And my question's about the insulin-sensitive obesity patients. I, I love that you talked about that because I'm seeing more and more of these patients with really high BMIs and low trigs and high HDL. And I just try to wrap my head around what that physiology is. Um, but so my question is, do you, would you approach their weight loss treatment in a different way than someone who is obese and diabetic and has high insulin levels, if high insulin's not the problem, is it still really about restricting carbs or do we need to think about this in a different way because maybe it's, it's a different physiology driving the problem? You want to, I can answer that too. Okay, I'll start. Um, my approach to patients like that, um, that are the insulin sensitive obese, is that I do tend to pay more attention to calories and I do use more fasting um, because it, it, they don't respond as fast as the insulin, you know, the insulin resistant patient. So that, that, that's something I learned from Ivor and Jeff in their book, and it actually turns out to be work out pretty well. Um, I would agree, and then I would also really lean into the lifestyle piece, you know, the sleep, the stress, I mean, all the underlying things that can exacerbate that, and depending on the age of the patient, really looking at sex hormones as a contributor, because I do find in, unfortunately, women north of 40 when they're in perimenopause and menopause, it just gets more challenging. And so really looking comprehensively at hormones and in addition to the lifestyle piece is very helpful. Yeah, I agree. And I'd particularly emphasize stress. You know, I think uh, stress is such an, and it was mentioned in, in the talks, it's such an underrated issue in, uh, in, in sort of glucose metabolism and, and hormonal metabolism. And, uh, you know, you can have, be on the best diet in the world, but if, uh, if you're st stressed to the hilt, then, uh, you know, you're not going to win. Yeah, I mean, I honestly don't often find that I have that information in front of me. You know, I mean, it's so rare that someone's checking insulin that it's, you know, I kind of have a more of a one-size-fits-all approach to obesity. And I think the first thing is, you know, you didn't get obese eating vegetables. You didn't get obese eating steaks, most likely. It's, it's the processed garbage. And you, you just got to address that basically addictive nature. And I just tell people... You know, load up. You know, I tell you, people ask me, how much meat do you eat? I say, eat enough so you don't want a damn cupcake. And I just, I just, that, that's my approach and it works. And it may take two or three months and they may not lose any weight, but once they kind of, they get that freedom from being addicted to this stuff. And I think you really have to address it because food addiction, it's a tough one because you don't have to, to exist in society, you don't have to do cocaine, you don't have to do alcohol, you don't have to smoke sugars, but you sure as hell have to eat. And so they have to deal with that every, you know, every day, multiple times a day. And so... I mean, like I said, it'd be nice to know, and maybe there are some differences in there, but I really have that in front of me to know the answer. Amazing question. So there's a question in the chat here, and if all of you have questions and you don't want to ask at the microphone, you can type it into the chat. One was about uh, stevia xylitol monk fruit, so non-nutritive sweeteners, concerns, opinions, perspectives from all of you all. Okay, I got the microphone. Um, you know, I think this is one of those things where uh, the research obviously is very mixed on this stuff. You know, people say, well, it's better than drinking Coca-Cola, right? So I think you certainly can make that argument. Um, you know, there's some, some concern around, you know, does it impact the microbiome? Well, quite frankly, every single thing in the world impacts our microbiome and the temperature does, you know, whatever. So um, I don't know that that enough is enough to dissuade me from, from using it. Now, I will say there are people that they just have to dissociate themselves from the taste of sweet for a period of time. And, you know, you, you, know, you tell them, hey, you can have some stevia. Full disclosure, I'll have some of these little electrolyte packs that have a stevia in it. It doesn't bother me. I don't have any problems with that. At least I don't, I can't tell that I do. Um, so uh, I think there's some that are better than others. I mean, surely, you know, things like, you know, uh, you know, uh, what are the ones, aspartame and things like that, 
tend to be worse. Maybe maybe monk fruit or stevia is slightly better in some regards, uh, but I, it, again, it tends to be highly individual. You know, people that, that struggle with addiction. You know, some I literally see people they'll have one piece of Lily's chocolate with with stevia, and they go on a six month bender. So I think you just got to you know, unfortunately, it has to be a little bit individualized. Yeah, I largely agree. I mean, I think they're uh, they're probably better than sugar, but uh, not better than nothing. And um, and there may be some that are the better than others. The problem is that uh, that we've all become addicted to sweetness, and uh, you know the food industry has done that very cleverly. And we uh, you know sweet is the new normal, and um, and so sometimes it can be very difficult to uh, to wean you off that. But um, I think you know if you keep using the artificial sweeteners you're not going to get rid of that addiction to sweetness. That, uh, that is really important, I think, that, uh, as part of the whole, uh, the whole program. Um, it's interesting. There was a non-nutritive sweetener study that was done in the fall, and it was comparing sucralose, aspartame, saccharin, and I don't know where anyone's still using that, and stevia. And it was looking the impact um, on the gut microbiome in mice over a 30-day, 28-day period of time. And what was interesting is that oral glucose tolerance tests um, were skewed and not in the right direction. And so I, I always encourage my patients to really examine their relationship with sugar in, in any form. I'm a complete realist, and I do think that Stevia and monk fruit are a, little, a bit more benign. I find a lot of people don't tolerate xylitol. They can find it very bloating and gaseous, uh, but really understand like these are things we should be consuming sparingly. Um, and obviously if you're not insulin sensitive, um, they really need to be eliminated from the diet, at least for a period of time. Yeah, I totally agree with you guys. I think the main issue for me is that people cannot really complain. I don't want to generalize completely, but I, I find that I have a lot more success when people are able to get off the, the sweetness addiction. So I really prefer to go without any artificial sweeteners. I prefer you even have a tiny bit of sugar rather than have uh, the, the full explosion of sugar in your mouth with artificial sweeteners. I mean, you have patients that are doing, you know, the whole thing with Diet Coke and they don't see, they're not getting better. And then you get the Diet Coke off and, and sometimes, sometimes you're surprised how much of a difference it makes. But other times it doesn't make that much of a difference. So it's kind of a tool that you can play with. And let's not forget what we learned yesterday about sorbitol, how sorbitol is actually making us sick. So, you know, lots of things that we're still finding out. I think excellent perspectives, and I'll just offer my opinion. I think from a biologic perspective, the non-nutritive sweeteners are relatively benign. I think the complication can be when you're having cookies, ice cream, treats that have non-nutritive sweeteners as the sweetener, the perception is that this is like a free ride. So if it had real sugar, you might only have a bite or two. But if it is sweetened with stevia, xylitol, you're like, oh, it's free. I'll have two or three pieces of the cake, pie, cookies, ice cream. So they can lend themselves to overconsumption. That's my only concern. But having a small amount, even during a fasting window, I don't think it's offering a super physiologic spike in insulin or glucose or leading to changes in fasting physiology. Great question. Hi, my name is Kerry Campanell, a family practitioner from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, what would you, how would you advise us to respond to people who would point us towards some of the studies that have been published in the past couple of years uh, claiming the superiority of plant-based diets with regard to parameters such as longevity and risk of heart disease and so forth? <laughs> I have, I've, I've answered this question before in the past, believe me. So I think, you know, first of all, I just don't buy any of the, any of the research on longevity. I just don't think we can know. I don't think the evidence is, is anywhere sufficiently rigorous enough to make those conclusions. So first of all, I, I just disregard the premise. Now, you know, when we talk about, you know, what is a comparator group? Well, if you're eating, you know, the garbage American diet and you cut most of that out and just eat carrots all day, yeah, you're going to lose some weight. Uh, but there are significant problems associated with a plant-based diet that are being shown more and more. There are studies on wound healing that shows they significantly have diffusion on wound healing. Uh, osteoporosis is a big problem for them. I mean, that's clearly being shown study after study has showed increased fracture rates. Uh, there are numerous studies showing mental health issues with vegetarian and vegan diets, you know, whether it's causal or, you know, a response to or, or mentally, mentally uh, you know, people with mental health disorders choose to eat vegan. It's, it's hard to say. So there's some definite limitations there. And I think the other thing is while people, you know, they'll, they'll point to the vegan bodybuilders and people that take the protein supplements can demonstrate that the majority of the people 
tend to struggle with protein. I know it's, I know it's, it's considered a, a myth among the vegan community, but you, we, we consistently see people with vegan diets, and that's why they have fractures, because their, their protein quality is not good. So I think those are serious, serious concerns. I mean, if somebody's ethically bound to it, that's a tough discussion, because you know, you can point, you can take them to a, a field and say, look at all these dead bunny rabbits and mice, and this is, this is from eating, you know, strawberries or whatever, and, and, and maybe that'll wake them up. But if it's just a health argument, it's a lot easier to, to, to show them literature that, um, at the very least, a, a non-junk food, non-processed food, omnivorous diet is going to be far superior to a vegan diet. You know, maybe carnivore may be a stretch for them, but... You know, I, I've seen, I just see a lot of vegan failures that go carnivore, and it, it, they, they almost have to do that to, to recover themselves. So, yeah, I'll let somebody else talk. Yeah, I think short term, you often get good response in a, with a vegan, vegan diet. And, and as Sean mentioned, any diet's better than the standard American diet. And so, you know, you're probably going to improve your diet by, by going vegan. But it's certainly the longer term issues that I have concerns with. And I, I want to add iron to that uh, to the list that uh, I think iron deficiencies are massively... Uh, underrated, uh, underdiagnosed problem. And uh, I think if you're female and vegan, you know, you're iron deficient by, by definition. And, it's, and uh, we know that iron, you know, I think we're understanding more and more about the role that iron plays in so many different metabolic processes. It's a very underrated uh, nutrient. So I have real concerns with iron and B12, but uh, iron, uh, especially in, in vegans. I echo everything else that my colleagues have said, but I would also say my concerns about these predominantly plant-based or plant-focused diets is that the macro, macronutrient ratio when you're looking at a piece of steak versus six cups of quinoa to get the equivalent amount of protein, most of our patients really need to be eating high, higher amounts of animal-based protein, less carbohydrate. And so I always go back to, does this make realistic sense? You know, beans and legumes, yes, I mean, intrinsically they can be healthy to pay, depending on the individual, but you can't make the argument to me that animal-based protein is, is not going to be a superior option. And Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who you all will see tomorrow, will talk more about this. Just recently I found out that um, protein eating has a big impact, or can have a big impact in the levels of uric acid in the blood. And that, at the same time, may have a huge impact on heart disease. And so I don't hear almost anybody in the, in the protein-focused community talking about this issue with the uric acid. And I don't know if you see it, but I see it. And I'm wondering how to deal with that, because I don't want to be you know, having high levels of uric acid. It doesn't sound like it's a good thing. Well, I don't think anybody eats protein by themselves. So I think it's, I, 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 I would imagine that, and we have the expert in uric acid here, so I would imagine that the context is, is what's important. In an insulin-resistant context, then you're probably going to be making more uric acid. I, but I, I, what do you think? <laughs> Am I butchering this, Rick? <laughs> yeah, no, I do study uric acid a lot, so... Uh, <laughs> You know, um, uric acid, besides increasing the risk for gout, uh, in people who have very high uric acid levels, it's been found in plaque. And 85% of people with gout can, will have, using these new scans, will have uric acid crystals in their blood vessels, uh, and particularly in areas of plaque. Uh, so it's, it's, it is something that's really important to, to discuss. But if you're on a, for example, if you're on a carnivore diet and you're on a, uh, which is basically a low carb diet, um, you, you know, you're not going to be developing, uh, you know, the uric acid is driving inflammation, but sort of uh, one of the ways it works is to, is to uh, activate the fructose pathway and activate and stimulate fructose production. And so from glucose, and so if you're on a low carb diet, you don't actually have that uh, you know, that, that bad aspect of uric acid isn't there. But the question of whether or not it can still crystallize in the blood vessels is a, is a good one. Um, today we heard that a low-carb diet, um, even with the high cholesterol, is not being associated with, with plaque, and, there's, uh, and a lot of people on low-carb diets have high uric acid. So it's not very clear to me 
uh, whether or not a high uric acid is going to be a problem in people with a carnivore diet or a low-carb diet. It looks like it may not be a problem, but in people who have metabolic syndrome, it really is a problem. So I, I'm not sure. I'd be interested in what you guys are seeing. Did that answer your question? Well, I would like to say that I'm thinking of a person that is metabolically healthy, has been keto or low carb for a long time. The consumption of fructose is minimum. Um, and so that's kind of like a thing that shows up in, I don't know what it will make of it, because it doesn't fit the, the profile. Right. No alcohol. So, okay. So, yeah, I, I, I you know, obviously have a lot of experience with, with this. You know, my uric acid level is actually normal range, which is kind of interesting considering I eat gazillions of pounds of meat every year. But um, what I tend to see, and I think, I think, again, I think it's like cholesterol, they can be a dependent variable. And I think when we look at like things like gout, which is what we commonly associate uh, high levels of uric acid with, you know, it depends on, you know, the inflammatory state, the metabolic health, temperature to some reason, why do, why do, why do gout crystals deposit in our, in our toes because they're colder and, you know, it's a simple, you know, chemistry dynamic. Um, and so I will see, you know, and for you guys that don't know, uric acid is actually an antioxidant. That's why we have it in our body in the first place. And so, I, again, I just think it's a dependent variable. And so I think you can have higher, relatively higher levels of uric acid and not see any deleterious effect depending on what else is going on. And so I think that's, you know, something that happens. And certainly, you know, when you're metabolically, like as a surgeon, when I used to operate on gout and I would do gouty tophi, which interestingly, when you cut their skin open, it looks like a big tube of toothpaste you squeeze out there. It's kind of cool. But, <laughs> but, you know, when you, almost every single gout patient I had had components, most of them were diabetics. I mean, most of them that I had to operate on that had that, they had some cell level, and probably if I would have tested them, they were hyperinsulinemic or something like that. So I think it's, again, I think it's a dependent variable. Thank you so much. Okay, there was a question from the live stream about reactive hypoglycemia waking up in the middle of night, uh, to hungry and low, uh, low blood sugar levels. This person mentioned they have a CGM and they go to bed with a normal glucose level. They wake up at two in the morning and it's dropped 25 points. Can anyone comment on that? So did I understand correctly? Hypoglycemia in the middle of the night? Reactive Reactive, yeah. So, you know, actually if you look at um, our cortisol, levels through the diurnal rhythm of, of cortisol, we see that around two or three in the morning is when you have your lowest cortisol and usually correlates with the lowest sugar of the day for diabetics. And then as cortisol rises, you start to see the, the, the increase. But also, um, you can also have like a reactive hypoglycemia that happens if you're eating a lot of, I don't know what this person's eating, but if you have, if you're eating a big meal, then you might have a, an insulin spike and then kind of crash. So that's also a, another component. So we do see the lowest sugars in, 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 in all of us uh, around 2 or 3 in the morning. And that's why also most type 1 diabetics have their, their biggest crashes around that time. Hi, my name's Greg with Natural Life. We're out of Boulder, and my question is this. This is something that's very rarely addressed, but if you've all, do you guys all know the work of um, Pottinger's cats? And the thing that I've asked a few people, and it's really not studied, I've been doing it for about 40 years where I eat mostly raw meat and raw milk, about a half a gallon a day, and when you looked at the cats, the cats that had the raw meat but had any kind of cook or processed milk, within three generations, died off, they could no longer procreate. By the second generation, they had terrible facial deformities, like cross teeth like we see in kids today. And by the third generation, the, the males became docile and the females became aggressive, but some of the males became pedophilic and would rape and kill the kittens, but they would never go on. But the ones that were on raw milk and raw meat were perfect each generation. And if you took the ones in the second generation and had them go all raw, within one to two generations, they completely went back to normal. And I wonder if anybody here has looked into that and that by cooking our meats, especially too much, we could be damaging them or denaturing them in such a way whereas it's having a de deleterious effect upon us. And if you guys can look at that, and, and I've been doing this for four, almost 40 years and I'm, I'm thriving, so I wonder to know what you guys think. Wow. <laughs> 
I don't look bad for almost 60. <laughs> that is impressive. I, I, I would say, I mean, I've read uh, about this, and, and you probably know a whole, a whole lot more about this, but um, I would say for 99% of people, it's not relevant. They can get better on cooked meat um, because, or, I, because this is what we see in practice. But there's always that percent that doesn't get better that maybe you're onto something here. So I'd like to hear what the other side. Yeah, I'm not an expert in this area, but I know if you are overcooking meat, you can, you know, like especially grilling meat, you get these advanced glycation like end products. And so cooking with oregano and thyme, so like specific types of herbs can improve that. But I, I don't feel like I know enough to be able to form a more, more of an opinion than that. Perhaps my colleagues. <laughs> well, I, I, I am just actually curious about at what age of, what, what is the age of consent for a cat? You know, we have a cat, so I'm just, you know, obviously human beings are not cats, so we have to acknowledge that, that thing. And I don't know if Bill Schindler's here, but he can talk about when do we start cooking as a species. I think he'll, he'll mention it's something like 1.5 million years ago. Uh, going back to Homo uh, erectus most likely. So, I mean, we're adapted to eating cooked food for sure. I mean, you know, um, are there advantages and disadvantages? I mean, certainly uh, raw meats have been part of human culture for, you know, beef carpaccio, steak tartare, you know, sushi, sashimi. So we still do that. We still have the capacity to do it. And I think for most people, it's generally okay. I mean, provided you're, you're cautious about the sourcing. I mean, I, I absolutely know people that have eaten raw meat on a carnivore diet got infected and had some really, really bad outcomes with that. So I think it's something to be concerned with. Um, you know, the whole pot, of, you know, we'll, I mean, if, if it required human beings to eat raw meat to be able to reproduce, I mean, why do we have 8 billion people on this planet? So, I mean, you know, so clearly that's not directly transferable. Might it have some benefit for some people? Yeah, sure, I, I, would, I would say so. But I think, again, I am, um, I'm fairly agnostic about whether you want to eat it cooked or raw or... Well, well done steak is kind of a crime. I, I would say that, but I mean, <laughs> but generally, um, you know, I, I, I haven't seen anything that's super compelling to me to say that all humans need to eat raw meat. Okay. I think it's a phenomenal question. I'll just quickly comment. There's been some studies in Europe looking at children that drink unpasteurized farm milk and they have compared to control groups where children are drinking ultra pasteurized homogenized milk, they have a lower prevalence of asthma, atopy, and allergies. So I think specifically in the context of raw dairy, if you were to choose ultra pasteurized homogenized dairy versus raw dairy, there probably is some health benefits. And the concern about listeria and other infections are probably quite low, so long as the sourcing, like Sean said, is good. So in that context, I think there's benefits, but obviously, as Sean alluded to, None of us would have been able to be fertile and, and procreate if eating cooked meat was damaging to fertility and building muscle and health. So I think with dairy, you know, we're not cats. So dairy probably matters and species specific context matters. But great question. Thank you so much. Hello, Renee Williams from Grand Junction, Colorado. I have a question about hormone and metabolic health and longevity. Um, when you, you mentioned several times, Cynthia, that as people approach menopause, women obviously approach menopause, men don't do that. Can I say that here? Is that okay? <laughs> okay, okay, moving on. All right, um, as women approach menopause, estrogen is an important part, right, of, of brain health, of bone density, all those good things, and, and, assume, and you're saying metabolic health. Is there a difference and a more product, protective factor between the different forms of estrogen between estradiol, estrone, and estriol as compared with, est with testosterone. It's like I opened up that can of worms during my talk. I have to accept it. <laughs> um, I, I would say, you know, based on my clinical experience, I think estradiol is, is the predominant hormone that I think is most important to replace when women, are, if, 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 if appropriate, in perimenopause, but definitely in menopause, um, you know, the 12 years without a menstrual cycle, um, without getting opening up another can of worms, I won't talk about the Women's Health Initiative and, and why we have a whole generation of clinicians fearful to prescribe hormones, patients are fearful to take it. Um, but I do feel like estradiol in particular is the one that is most beneficial for insulin sensitivity and the one that I feel like my patients get the best outcomes from when it is actually repleted. Testosterone, I feel like you have to actually get the estrogen levels, uh, the receptors optimized before you can add it. And that can be very beneficial for not just ba bone, brain, muscle health, but also uh, body composition, which I know for a lot of women in middle age is a source of endless frustration. 
<laughs> I'll just quickly comment, and that's a phenomenal question. I think DHEA is under-recognized in peri and post-menopause. Uh, a lot of folks don't test that. They look towards testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone, but DHEA for postmenopausal women is very important as well. So I would definitely look at DHEA sulfate and consider replacement. Actually, we'll go to this side. Hi, <clears throat> my name is uh, Jan Hogström from Sweden. I'm uh, an anecdote, N equals one, you could say. <clears throat> I have a type two question. Uh, I'm a type two reversed with influence from all these rock stars. Um, <laughs> thank you. And my question is, I'm at no meds at all. I've been suggested three meds. But in the longevity sphere, there's a lot of talk about metformin having uh, uh, benefits. Will I live longer with a little bit of metformin? What question? Should we recommend metformin? I love metformin. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, in diabetics when you don't, you know, it's it's the it's a drug that we know fairly well. We've been using it for a hundred years. Um, it it seems to improve. Um, there is some interesting data. Um, it's also very interesting in cancer. Um, I I'm not against it. Okay, I'm not, I'm not against it, and sometimes I like to uh, prescribe it. If there's like a little bit of insulin resistance and the person is not interested in the diet, or I think, I think it's, a, it's a good tool that we have. And um, I, I myself actually did some, uh, looked at the data of like thousands of patients, uh, um, cancer patients, and, and de definitely there, I think uh, it looks interesting, although there, there are still controversial papers that con contradict each other. Um, and I think that there is data that in, in people who exercise a great deal, um, then maybe it's not a good idea um, to use metformin because of its mechanism of action. But um, I, I'm, I think uh, metformin is a, is a tool that can be used, and it's cheap. And it causes a lot of side effects, so that's the bummer with it. But they're, sorry, but they're, but they're not long-term effects. They're just... <laughs> So I'm, 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 I'm generally, if you don't need to be on a drug, uh, that's my general heuristic, you know, not why be on the drug. And as she pointed out, uh, there is some uh, negatives associated with, with uh, adaptations to exercise to the mitochondria, uh, gut, gut, gut uh, side effects or problems with that. You know, most of these, most medications somehow are, are some basically kind of poisons and say basically, you know, why, you know, does it limit our ability to, uh, 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 for hepatic glucose uh, uh, production, is that normal? It's, it's an abnormal, it puts you in an abnormal physiologic okay. state. Now, if you're a diabetic and your blood glucose is too high and it lowers your blood glucose, isn't that effect beneficial? You know, that's probably true. If you're no longer diabetic and you've, you've gotten rid of diabetes and you like to exercise, um, I'm not convinced that metformin is going to make you live longer. I mean, you know, there's some people that will talk about that, maybe they'll say berberine or something like that, but I'm... You know, I'm of the opinion that um, if you don't need a drug for a clinical reason, then you probably need to probably just avoid it. Yep. Yeah, I, th <clears throat> I think we all have far too many drugs. Um, I always thought, you know, that uh, if we took the whole world off all their polypharmacy, so most, you know, they have five, six, we, we saw that case before with, what, 10 drugs? So if we stopped everyone's drugs, Probably 2% of the people would die. The other 98% would feel a whole lot better. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to... Uh, <laughs> my medical defence probably wouldn't agree with me doing that. But, uh, you know, I think any time we can get someone off a drug, then we're better off. I really appreciate the question. I think a lot of us are curious and, and we get excited about these novel compounds, whether it's metformin, low-dose rapamycin. But I think all of us shouldn't even consider that until we're lifting weights three to four days per week, walking after meals, prioritizing exercise, and then maybe microdosing these things periodically and not doing them long term, but focusing on exercise. You, wanted, you mentioned, will I live longer? Yeah. A new study found that people who preserve lean muscle mass are less likely over a five year period of time to have a heart attack. So I think the, the best thing that we can do is move our bodies and, and work on preserving lean mass throughout life. 
Grip strength. Sean Baker has shared a lot of studies over the years about <laughs> independent correlations with grip strength and all-cause mortality. So I think we should focus more on that, getting stronger, getting more physically fit, and not worrying about the potential or the, the potential benefits of these compounds that, as you just heard, do have side effects and complications, depleting B vitamins and much more. But great question. Yep. Let's go back you. over here. My name is Eric Westman, Duke University. I realize, thank you for your presentations. We have an amazing array of backgrounds and research and clinical experience. And so with what I've read and, and what I do clinically and what I do personally, it may all be very different. So I'm wondering what you do, what your read of the literature is about measuring ketones. Should, do we have to do them? Is it good to do? Do you advocate that in your patient population, ketone measurement, or any, any, in any form? And, and I just have to say, I don't. I, I don't measure. Oh, and then do you measure your own ketones? Are, are you measuring glucose and ketones? Because you know, you're a practitioner, you, you've read all these papers, and we all have our own way of kind of uh, figuring out what we should do. And what, often, often what we do is different than what we do in our patients. And Anyway, so do you, um, do carnivores get ketones, for example, and do you recommend them in your patients, and then do you measure them clinically? Um, what do I do? Very little. <laughs> I mean, I've been eating this way for eight years, very low carb, um, probably ketogenic most of the time. When I check, I am in ketosis, but it's happened like just because I'm showing like a patient to check. I, I, it's, it's individualized. This is, you know, as you know better than anybody, the the art of medicine. Some people want to check everything. Some people don't want to check anything. Um, they, they want to be left alone. And they, my thing is that we shouldn't medicalize this so much. This is a diet. So it depends what you're treating it for. But I think, you know, this is a way of life. So I'm, I'm not going to change what I eat really based on if, if I'm in ketosis or not, because also it's a point in time, right? So, and you know, I, I, I think, again, it needs to be individualized, and I don't think it's necessary. Um, I'm a gadget person, so I'm the first person to admit that when I say this, I take it with a grain of salt. I think a lot of it is, I agree with you, bioindividuality, you know, what is your patient like? Sometimes it provokes anxiety to have more data. Some patients are data nerds like I am, and I want to know all the things. I personally don't check ketones. I focus more on glucometers and CGMs. Um, and just helping people understand like the signs that will indicate they are in ketosis or they're you know, becoming more fat adapted. And so I, I just find that uh, I can motivate my women with a CGM or, or, or a glucometer if I need to, but I'm not typically checking ketones in my practice. Yeah, I'm a, I guess I'm a bit similar in that I don't uh, do it routinely. But uh, yeah, as was mentioned, I mean, some people really want to know everything about their, uh, their health, but it's also about you know, as CGM, I mean, I think the great advantage of CGM is such an educational tool, you know, because people learn what effect certain foods have on their, uh, on their, uh, their glucose level. And similarly with ketones, you know, you can uh, measure the foods that kick you out of ketosis, that put you back into ketosis. So f maybe even when you start a ketogenic diet, it can be quite helpful as part of your education process. But I certainly don't think it's necessary sort of uh, long term. Yeah, first of all, Eric... By the way, thanks for what you've been doing over the years. I mean, you've been a uh, pioneer in this, and thank you for doing that. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not laboring over the, key, the ketone research. I mean, you know, I'm pretty lazy myself. I, I you know, I, I, I spend my time other areas. But, you know, given the fact that you can gain weight while being in ketosis, given the fact that your blood ketone level is, is a product of how much you produce, how much you utilize, and, and what's left over is wasted, and that, that variable is maybe unknowable. Uh, the times I've been checking for ketones, I, I produce a very small amount of ketones. I don't worry about it. Again, I got into that uh, problem as an athlete. You know, the, my goal was to throw things really far, and I was focusing on how much I could deadlift, which sort of correlated, but wasn't a direct thing. And so I think outside of, you know, maybe epilepsy or maybe certain cancer treatments where you're really concerned about glucose ketone index and stuff like that, I think for most people, it's probably... You know, because it can be anxiety provoking because what if they're not in ketosis and they think they should be and then like, oh my God, they're freaking out and then they derive some stress response to that. And then, so I think, you know, keep the goal the goal. And, and most of us goal is not to have a ketone of two plus, it's 
to lose weight or feel better. So I find it to be, you know, kind of interesting. And by the way, they're developing, as you may know, they're developing continuous ketone monitors. And they're coming out now. And what are you going to do with that information? It's just gonna, I mean, somebody's going to make some money on that probably, and we're all going to talk about it. And it's going to be, like, you know, it'll, it'll just be interesting and kind of funny to see. But I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And, you know, they paid me to hit things with a hammer. And, you know, I, I kind of expect these things really simple. Thank you. Hey, Andrew Anderson. And uh, so low carb for seven years, decided to jump on the wagon of carnivore after listening to you, Dr. Baker and Ken Berry in November. Was on it for six weeks, felt great. Physical performance went through the roof. Mental performance is better. I uh, decided to have one big cheat day, uh, salad and uh, fruit. I lost 50 IQ points, which left me with two the next day. I felt like crap for three days, joint pain and everything else. Can you explain any of the mechanisms and why that happened? Yeah, all vegetables are poison. No, I, I agree. <laughs> the, uh, okay. Okay. No, I mean, I think, you know, you adapt. And, I'm, you know, like I said, it's the, the, the experience you share with, with feeling better and your cognitive performance and, mental, and physical performance. I see it all the time. So I'm, I'm not, I, you know, I, I, that's consistent with what I see pretty typically. Um, I think, you know, uh, our gut, you know, our gut microbiome changes in a day, you know, or even in less, in, in a few hours, in fact. And so I think we developed uh, tolerances to things. Like when you go, when, when you're, when you start out drinking alcohol, you know, one drink and you're feeling tipsy, you know, yeah. you know, six years in, if you've been drinking a fifth of whiskey every day, one drink's not going to do anything to you. So we developed these tolerances to things. And so if whatever you're eating was, you know, problematic for you, um, you just don't have the tolerance built up. So maybe if you slowly reintroduce stuff over time, You'll see that we see that with like CGM to, or not CGMs uh, oral, oral glucose tolerance tests, low carb people. If, if if I take an oral glucose tolerance test tomorrow, I'm gonna fail it. I'm gonna have a blood glucose of 300. If you give me carbs for a week or so, you know I'll develop those. You know I'll upregulate enzymatic pathways and so on and so forth. So I think it's just a matter of those are abrupt transitions, and that's one of the dangers of going carnivore is you you drop in something in there, even if it's, even if it's a relatively healthy food. It can cause particularly GI upset and other things like that, and joint pain, and I think those all related to you know an inflammatory response that occurs. So it doesn't mean you can never eat that again, yeah. but you just have to be mindful of it. Gotcha. I, I think I'm just going to stick with the ribeyes, honestly. So thanks. <laughs> Too short. <laughs> so my question is: I hear more and more about ketogenic therapies or carnivore diets as a way to reverse certain disease states like type two diabetes or immune disorders. Um, so I've heard, and actually I think it was a video with uh, Mike and Thomas Delauer talking about a way of getting out of the ICU. So what's your take on using a ketogenic therapy or carnivore diet in order to reverse a disease state, but then do you recommend just prolonging the use of that therapy or, you know, keep using that diet and then do something else? Or you think instead you should just stick with the carnivore diet for life? Okay, I'll talk to that because um, I think it's a great tool. I think it's a great elimination diet. I think uh, most people that I come in contact with that do a carnivore diet, they'll do it for a period of time. They'll fix whatever the issue is and then they'll introduce food. And most people ever do it successfully. And I think that's fine. There are some people, however, that feel so good and they like it and they like the simplicity of it and they stick on it for years and years. And I think either is fine. I mean, quite honestly, I, I think you can live on just meat indefinitely. I, th I think it's, it provides everything you need. I don't think you'll end up with deficiencies. I've been doing it for basically seven years, and I'm not fading away. I'm not, like, nutritionally devoid, you know. So, <laughs> so I mean, um, you know, I know we're running out of time here, and I'm sorry. But, yeah, I think that um, if you go to, if you approach it as a tool to heal something, it's, it's much more easier to accept mentally. I'm going to do this for six months. I'm going to fix my problems, and then I'll take it, and then I'll reassess where I'm at. And I think one of the things is you have to be very – methodical about how you reintroduce foods. And it may depend on what situation you're in, whether you had Crohn's disease or psoriasis or depression, they're all gonna respond a little bit differently. That's where I think we're in. Uh, Amber O'Hearn, who, who's here, has made this really nice thing that we're all very similar human beings, but how we break can be very unique. And so if we're broken in different ways, then we have different tolerances afterwards. So yeah, I think I always encourage people to, you know, once they've solved their problems, hey, give it a try, try to reintroduce. Some do, some don't. Some do it fine. Some, some have problems. But, yeah, it doesn't have to be a lifetime thing.